Alex Powell is a lecturer in law at Oxford Brookes University. They're an expert in migration law, specifically uh, refugee and asylum issues relating to LGBT people. And they're going to be discussing with me now the government's anti-migrant legislation, including the, um, the latest attack on migrants, the Illegal Migration Bill. And we're going to be discussing the uh, impact of that legislation on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers. So thank you so much, Alex, for joining us today. How are you doing? Yeah, very well, thank you. How about you? I am tired. Uh, I'm getting to the end of the show uh, with my blood being purely made up of caffeine, uh, but that mm. is the way we do it. Uh, so thank you so much for joining, Alex. So obviously we know this government has introduced legislation after legislation that is hostile and attacking of migrants and refugees. The latest iteration of that is the Illegal Migration Bill, which is going through Parliament at the moment. What's the summary of the changes that the government's trying to introduce there? So I think the, the really interesting thing actually about the Illegal Migration Bill is, is how it's very much much the same as the Nationality and Borders Act. It extends substantively on many powers that were already granted under the preceding piece of legislation that just went through last year. So part of the core focus is on making inadmissible the claims of those who have entered the UK unlawfully, which is to say, uh, for example, it's mainly targeting people crossing uh, the channel, uh, particularly those coming via Calais. Um, so in that sense, it provides that the Secretary of State for the Home Department, Suella Braverman, must make an order for the removal of anyone who has entered the law, uh, UK unlawfully or who has entered the UK deceptively. Um, so it, that's very, very concerning in the sense that it will mean that removal decisions are ordered against people in a sense where prior to the recent raft of legislation, it's worth saying some of this sort of was already put in place under the Nationality and Borders Act. But prior to these two pieces of legislation, they would have had the right to have a full process around their uh, asylum claim. Uh, so it's really targeting people who've entered the UK unlawfully and trying to prevent them from accessing the international regime of refugee protection, or rather the UK's implementation of that. And so let's let's start by unpicking that concept of entering the UK unlawfully. Could you talk us through the the kind of uh, what that means in terms of the the law, but also the 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 current process in which people can claim asylum in the UK? Yeah. So in terms of entering the UK lawfully, what we're looking at here basically is the UK has quite a large raft of what you call the immigration rules, um, and this is a body of secondary legislation. So it's largely made up of statements of changes posted by the Secretary of State for the Home Department. Obviously, in, in the UK, secondary legislation is inferior to primary legislation. So this can be changed more easily than if it were in statutes. Now, those immigration rules provide various routes to enter the UK lawfully. Uh, for example, you could enter via gaining an investor's visa. Uh, and that would be based on your bringing of capital into the UK, uh, giving you a lawful right to entry. Or you could enter based on a spousal visa. Basically, what we're talking about when we talk about illegal migration is someone who has entered the UK without a legal right to do so. So either they're not either they're from a country that requires visas and do not have one, or they have entered the UK in some sense irregularly without going through the prescribed channels. Generally speaking, in UK law, the prescribed channels would require you to claim in advance of your arrival. Um, we saw this as an example with the Ukraine scheme, where they had to very quickly change the process to create a legal route for Ukrainians to enter the UK, because given Brexit, they wouldn't have had one uh, it, prior to the Ukraine scheme. So when we talk about legal entry, really, we're thinking about people yeah, who've entered irregularly or without lawful permission. Now, asylum is kind of separate from that in many senses. The UK is a signatory to the 1951 Convention on the Status of Refugees, which is a UN treaty. Um, created in the aftermath of World War II. Um, and that basically provides uh, an international definition of who is a refugee. So by that document, uh, signatory states have signed up to recognise anyone who is, uh, for reason of their nationality, um, race, religion, membership, particular social group or political opinion outside their country of origin, 
and for that reason, unable or unwilling to return to it. So they basically need to, to fear persecution for one of those five grounds. If they do that, then signatory states have signed up to say, we will recognize them as refugees. So under that system, there is no sort of international body that can binding decide who's a refugee. Individual states have to create their own processes. So the UK as a country has its own process. And that is to say, if you want to claim asylum, you would need to go through a process of claiming at the Home Office. And you'd go through uh, an initial interview where they take the basis of your claim, a substantive interview where they take the full facts, uh, and then they would issue a decision on whether or not you're a refugee. Now, the interaction between the Nationality and Borders Act, the Illegal Migration Bill, and this is that the two acts both put someone in a situation where those who've entered unlawfully are sort of prohibited from making that asylum claim. Their claim is inadmissible at the first stage. So they are prevented from going down that process of making a claim and claiming refugee status. In that regard, it's important to say that under Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, uh, signatory states are directly uh, instructed that they should not penalise uh, refugees for their mode of entry, which is to say they should not penalise people for unlawfully entering a country where the purpose of that unlawful entry was to claim asylum. Uh, so it's questionable whether the UK is now in compliance with the Refugee Convention uh, with this recent legislation. Um, I hope that's reasonably clear. There's these two two points. Yeah. That's incredibly helpful. I guess the, the next thing I wanted to ask you really is mm. the Illegal Migration Bill, you've obviously said, uh, is very, very similar in its nature to the National Latin Borders Act. Mm. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how well, both those pieces of legislation really fit into the wider scheme of anti-migrant legislation we've seen the Tories introduce since 2010? Yeah, so I mean, I think there are there's sort of two, two answers to draw out here, one relating to migration as a whole and one relating specifically to refugees. But obviously, these are these are deeply interlinked. Um, and actually, it involves going back to quite early in the Conservative government's time. We can think back to sort of 2010, the 2010s and the uh, net migration gap. There was this idea of getting uh, net migration down to the tens of thousands. And in those numbers, uh, they count everything from international students to uh, refugees, uh, somewhat in many cases, illogically. Uh, but nonetheless, because of that net migration cap, we initially saw this huge focus on effectively numbers reduction. Uh, and this obviously links to what was at once termed the hostile environment and is now termed the compliance environment. But generally speaking, since 2010, all of the legislation has been aimed at making it harder to exist in the UK without regularised status. Now, when someone lacks regularised status because they feared persecution, the general route that they might have to regularise their status to become a lawful resident in the UK would be to go through the process of claiming refugee status or some other form of human rights protection. But for simplicity, let's just consider that as part of refugee status here. Um, what these bills basically do is they stop people from regularising their status. So, uh, for example, uh, when you're thinking of the Nationality and Borders Act, which is in force, uh, we've obviously had the recent situation with uh, a large number of Albanian claimants coming to the UK. Actually, more than 50% of claims from those people where they are processed are ending in success, that is to say they're being recognised as refugees. However, because they've entered the UK unlawfully, the Nationality and Borders Act would render all of them unable to claim refugee status. So in that sense, it sort of fits into this wider zeitgeist because it leaves people unable to regularise their status and therefore unable to, uh, well, access employment, access housing, because then they come into the wider system of the compliant environment, which still has right to rent checks, which has employment uh, check, uh, right checks, you know, checking passports and such. Uh, to ensure you have status uh, before you're able to work. So in that sense, it, it fits in because it, it really hardens the edges there to make sure that even those who historically, because of their specific situations, may have been able to gain access to society unmediated by this matrice of laws that are aimed to make life, as, I mean, literally aimed to make life as intolerable as possible for migrants. Um, that's not even my view that's the government's open and stated aim of the policy um, so you know it, it, it's really hardening the edges there and I think it's important to note in that regard that the illegal migration bill even removes some of the protection for uh people who are victims of human trafficking 
in terms of the Modern Slavery Act and, and the way in which that applies. So they are really trying here to make it impossible for people who have entered the UK irregularly to claim status. Um, and I think this sits as a wider part of a sort of shift in the framing of, of asylum um, that the government is actually engaged in. I actually link this as well to the Ukraine scheme, to the Hong Kong scheme, to the Afghan scheme, because there you saw responses to particular situations where the UK government allowed people entry uh, for specific circumstances. But the point of the international refugee definition under the convention was always that you claim as an individual, you are claiming that you are persecuted for this reason and you need the protection of another country. So the UK is really cracking down on that by making it hard to enter illegally because necessarily when you're fleeing, it's very hard to regulate, regularize your status. You know, If you are fleeing persecution from your government, the chances that you have time to log onto the internet and just let the Home Office know in advance you're coming by putting forward a claim are not high. It's not at all responsive to people's lived experiences. Um, so I, I think you know, one way in which I, these bill, these two acts, well, the bill and the act, uh, shift us forward, is in really putting this focus on countries, not people. The, the discourse becomes about safe countries, not about the rights of an individual to claim asylum, which is what is protected in international law, which is what the UK has agreed to uh, protect and recognise. So, yeah, um, yeah, I think there's my real concern here is that it sort of links in in that sense of making it very hard to regularise your status, even if you're fleeing, fleeing persecution. So... We've, we've talked obviously here about this in general terms and on previous episodes of the show we've had Benali Hamdash, the Green Party's migration spokesperson and Oppenheim, the um, activist with Labour campaign for free movement about the various different pieces of anti-migrant legislation. But we've got you on and one of your areas of expertise is around uh, LGBT plus um, asylum and refugee uh, issues and so I wondered if you could talk us through the impact of this suite of legislation and conditions on LGBT refugees and asylum seekers in particular? Yeah, thank you. So um, my research has predominantly been with LGBT uh, asylum seekers and refugees themselves. So I've undertaken interviews with them, uh, basically with a view to understanding prior to the National Asian Borders Act, it's important to say, uh, how they experienced the UK uh, asylum system as queer people and also the extent to which the UK asylum system's attempts to effectively confirm that they were LGBT IQA plus uh, sort of corresponded to their lived reality so it was looking at how does the UK determine whether or not you are or will be perceived as a sexual and gender minority so those issues actually are exacerbated by the new legislation so under section 12 of the Nationality and Borders Act uh, there is a provision to raise the standard of proof in asylum claims. Uh, and the nature of sexual or gender identity is obviously something that is quite intangible. In that sense, quite hard to prove. It's not uh, something that you can easily say, here is my evidence that I am this status. Um, outside of asking for very, very unsuitable forms of evidence, perhaps. Uh, so immediately we've seen, and this is well raised within the asylum literature in academic studies, a real issue in terms of credibility and proving that someone is LGBT. Uh, and as it was before, uh, every asylum claim was treated on the basis of a very low burden of proof, standard of proof. The standard of proof was the balance of probabilities. Sorry, no, the sound of the proof was reasonable degree of likelihood. So is it more like, is it likely, basically? Is it likely that this person is this status? It's been raised to the balance of probabilities, which is more likely than not. So you're suddenly required to do more to prove that you are who you say you are, that you are LGBT, and indeed to prove every element of your claim. Uh, this obviously has a disproportionate impact because there is less likely to be any objective evidence of your sexual orientation and gender identity. And indeed, uh, many people in the countries of origin will have specifically taken steps to hide uh, those identities in order to avoid the fear of persecution. 
uh, which obviously means that they're unlikely to be able to present a narrative that, that then let evidence sit. So firstly, that's a real, real problem um, under Section 12 of the Nationality and Borders Act. Uh, and it's something that will disproportionately impact sexual and gender minority claimants. Um, but then secondly, also you get issues here in respect of the system of inadmissibility. So I said about those asylum claims being inadmissible. Now, the UK's approach where the claim is inadmissible is firstly to say, can we return them to a third safe country? Uh, and obviously this is partly because uh, the UK would say, well, you've entered unlawfully and you've done so passing through a third safe country, such as France, that is when your claim will be admiss inadmissible. Uh, so firstly, they say, can we return you to a third safe country? Now, currently, no country is going to take those returns. So although the UK would say their claim is inadmissible, there's nowhere to remove them to. The only country which the UK has agreed a removal agreement to is Rwanda. So that is what the Memorandum of Understanding with Rwanda effectively is. It is the establishment of Rwanda as a third safe country for the purposes of sending people whose asylum claims have been rendered inadmissible pursuant to Section 16 or 15 of the Nationality and Borders Act. 15 is about EU nationals. Uh, so that was sort of part of the law already uh, when the UK was an EU member and is creating something that already existed. 16 is the entirely new element because it exports that globally. Um, but then also this is uh, exacerbated under Section 2 of the new Act, which puts an even more strict requirement on the Secretary of State to remove them effectively. Um, so the problem, of course, there is that Rwanda is actually a refugee country of origin for LGBT claimants. It, it doesn't have any laws criminalizing sexual or gender identity specifically, uh, but uh, refugees have been received, including to the UK, from uh, Rwanda. And indeed, the UK Foreign Office advises caution to LGBT people traveling to Rwanda who are British citizens. So there's a real problem there in that the UK is declaring as safe countries who are not necessarily safe for certain types of claimants. Um, and I think that it is in, in sort of full disclosure, there is a requirement on the Secretary of State or the Secretary of State may rebut the inadmissibility of a claim in a situation where that person would face persecution in the safe country. Uh, but there's not currently any clear process for how this is happening. Uh, and we've seen this in the recent AAA decision of the High Court, where they said that the Rwanda policy could be lawful, but you'd need to individually assess each claim. Uh, and you can see there that sort of linking to what I'm saying, because the courts are reminding the government, in effect, this is supposed to be an individual process. You can't just call countries safe, which is now why we're seeing the illegal migration bill, in effect, to try and reassert. Uh, even, the, well, in my view, to reassert that even though this is clearly not what the Refugee Convention imagined, we want you to do it anyway. Um, so there's a real issue here, basically, in that the UK, in pursuance of, let's say, exporting its responsibilities to refugees, is partnering with countries who, uh, at the least, will not necessarily guarantee the safety of particular types of claimant, and is doing so in a way that leaves very little room for detecting those problematic cases where they arise. So uh, if your claim is determined to be admissible, you in theory have just 14 days to challenge that. Now, uh, finding legal representation in the asylum and immigration system is nearly impossible. Um, legal aid rates have been uh, deeply sort of limited. Uh, and even where you can find legal aid, actually the number of legal aid lawyers in any given locality is extremely low. So for example, uh, I'm obviously based at Oxford Brook. In Oxfordshire, there is one firm in the whole county of Oxfordshire that does legal aid immigration work. And in that firm, there is one person who does LGBT uh, cases. So you're talking there, you know, possibly half a million people in, in the geographic region served by a single firm that's doing legal aid immigration work. And I think this is all the worse in the context of the UK government's dispersal policy, where claimants are sort of sent to various places around the UK, because it's very possible as a claimant, you'll be sent to a very, very rural area where there is not uh, legal aid representation available, but also especially where there's not legal aid representation that knows how to deal with LGBT cases. And just to say as well, when the Home Office does assess those cases, when they're not inadmissible, what they often look for is a sort of narrative that mirrors LGBT identity in the UK. For example, they seem to put a lot of weight on whether you go to pride parades, which might be hard to do if they disperse you to 
rural Wales. Um, so there's a real disconnect here between this sort of idea that you can say this is a safe country and the concrete realities of individual claimants. And it is uh, LGBT claimants, uh, most likely women, uh, and other people have particular vulnerabilities that will be hit the hardest by this policy. The same would go as well for, um, let's say, people whose age is indeterminate, because we've seen the UK's record for sort of determining that 14 year old is in fact 21. Uh, and again, under this system, they'd have very little protection from being sent on their own to Rwanda. Um, and just for one more point to add there is that actually it's worth considering that as a sort of added cruelty to this, the UK would still say that they were returned, even though they're being returned to a country they have literally never been to and have no personal connection to uh, whatsoever. It's a pretty obviously bleak <laughs> description of the current state of play, which I suppose is, you know, what we'd expect. Um, to end on a slightly more, I guess, I mean, uh, we're talking about awful, an awful situation here, but so to end on a slightly more positive note in, in one sense, um, what do you think, what reforms do you think are needed to the migration system so that we could have a fair and humane process for asylum for LGBT refugees? So I think there's, again, sort of two answers. I think there's a, an overriding answer, like a sort of utopian answer, if you like, which is effectively that we should still consider abolishing borders as an answer to this. At the end of the day, the forms of violence we are talking about are largely structured by and created by the imposition of artificial lines in the sand. There are, don't get me wrong, there are arguments in favour of borders as well in terms of them giving rights to self-determination and stuff like that. But I put it out there because when we have these conversations, people often assume that the border is a prerequisite and then we talk about how we should manage it and it's actually a human construct that we could decide to do away with. At a more realistic level, uh, because I don't think any, at least, uh, party likely to be in government in the next few years is going to uh, listen to the idea of abolishing borders, there are other things uh, we could do very concretely to improve the situation now. So the first thing we need to do is to scrap the Illegal Migration Bill. Uh, this bill will not solve the issues. And indeed, the argument the government makes effectively is that this is to break the model of human trafficking, uh, which completely ignores the fact that the model of human trafficking is directly caused by UK government policy. If the UK wants to break the model of trafficking, what they need to do is to create safe and legal routes. Frankly, human traffickers will be rub rubbing their hands with glee at the prospect of another policy that strengthens the border and makes it more necessary to arrive secretively, not through official routes. Um, and indeed, the likely consequence of the illegal migration bill will be people cease presenting themselves to the Home Office and claiming asylum, and you see even more irregularised status occurring in the UK. Um, so we need to scrap the illegal migration bill. It's also another concrete thing you could do right now is to repeal sections 15, 16 and 12 of the Nationality and Borders Act, uh, as well as the stuff around citizenship. But I'll, I'll leave that for, for someone who's more of an expert in the field of citizenship. Uh, but we need to um, remove those sections because, in effect, they again exacerbate the problems that is currently faced by the UK migration system. The problems the UK migration system faces is effectively an absolutely unassailable backlog, not caused by a rise in the number of people coming, but caused by horrific underfunding of migration services, if you like. I hate that phrase, but migration services in the UK. Um, our numbers are not vastly different from France, but France has actually invested in faster processing. Our numbers are not vastly different from Canada. Again, Canada has invested in faster processing of claims. It has hired more people to do the claims determination part. Um, and actually, I think that's a, a really concrete thing that you could do is even if the government is committed to, to keeping its current uh, process and, you know, morally unjustifiable, but even if they are, then they really do need to listen to migration experts in terms of the urgent need to increase the funding, because a lot of the issues are simply caused by the fact that the Home Office cannot cope with the volume of claims that it is dealing with. When the Conservatives came into government, there was an aim of dealing with cases within six months. That has been completely scrapped, and the average case time now is taking more than two years. So if you want to talk about backlogs, the people arriving 
on sort of at Calais are, are not really a part of that. It's, it's the fact that claims are not being processed quickly. Now, th this is bad for asylum claimants because during the period of a claim, you're not allowed to work. Often you will find yourself uh, with reporting obligations to the Home Office and you live that whole time um, with the sort of fear of deportation hanging over you, not to mention the fact you can't leave the UK if you because you wouldn't be able to come back. So it's obviously bad for claimants, but it's also very, very bad for the state. You know, the government talks about the huge costs of the migration system. A lot of those actually exist because of the backlog and because this means that we have people who we have no choice but to house in hotels or to house in barges. So actually, you know, for all I can talk about repealing the legislation, the thing the government truly could do is to stop the performative cruelty and actually try and deal with the problem. Because at no point in the last five years have they tried to deal with the problem. All they've wanted to say is that they are tough on things, which does nothing to solve the problem. It exacerbates the issue. Every piece of legislation we've seen on immigration and asylum since 2010 has been counterproductive uh, for the purposes that it's been claiming to meet. As I said, human traffickers have rubbed their hands with glee at the policies the UK government have adopted. The reality is that much like with drug decriminalization, if you want to break a model of organized crime, what you need to do is to create safe and legal ways for the activity to take place. Humans will always move. It's, it, you cannot legislate that away. Uh, and frankly, with coming issues of climate change, coming uh, shifting global politics, uh, forced migration is going to continue to grow. Uh, and the UK has no answer to this with its current policies. We really do need to start looking at creating safe and legal routes, and that would help with in terms of ensuring a humane system, because it would mean people weren't forced to take dangerous journeys. It would mean we don't have a rolling death toll of people who've been killed effectively directly by the UK's border policies. Um, they're not killed by human traffickers. They are killed by the UK holding such a hard line that forces people to take dangerous routes. Um, I think the last thing I'd say is all of this also needs to be met with a rise in the availability of legal advice. Uh, again, this is not just a problem of migration. The states in this regard, this is actually part of austerity. Um, the Legal Aid Sentencing Act of 2012 basically has stripped out uh, immigration uh, sort of representation in exactly the same way as it's done with welfare claim, it's done with family law. And actually the UK legal system is in an incredibly unhealthy state because it's been run in such a careless and financially unsustainable way. Um, and it's a real problem now that we have so many people who are not really able, and I, I should add here, the Law Commission looked at immigration law in, uh, I think it was 2018, I can't exactly remember the year. But anyway, they, they critiqued its labyrinthian complexity and stressed that even judges get the law wrong because it is so complicated. It also changes almost weekly because it can be changed by basically ministerial fiat. So actually, you know, without decent legal representation, there's no way people can navigate this system. Uh, so, you know, uh, we need to, to, to row back on some of these legislative enactments. We need to create safe and legal routes. But we also need to look at this as more of a, a global system of what's been happening to the UK legal system over recent years to ensure people can access a lawyer, to ensure that when people come to the UK and they are claiming asylum, they have livable housing conditions. Not, again, the performative cruelty of sticking people on a barge so you can throw some red meat to your voters, which actually costs more than, say, putting people in housing and, hey, how about while we're here, giving them the right to work, as most actually other countries do. I mean, it seems absurd to talk about the sort of cost of sheltering and feeding people when it's only your policy on not letting them work that stops you. And the last thing I'll say, because I realize I'm going in circles a bit here, is um, we really, really need to challenge the thoroughly debunked idea of poll factors. So Lucy Maybelin's done some fantastic work on this. The UK government caught constantly about breaking the model. Uh, they say we need to make it unattractive for people to come here. This is called basically poll factors. They think that there are poll factors like uh, people think that life is better in the UK, so they come here. Lu Lucy Maybelline's research actually found that this has a near zero effect on the likelihood of the UK as a destination. Far more likely are things like shared language and family ties. So maybe rather than this performative cruelty, we might want to think about how colonialism has created the conditions which we are now seeing. And um, 
you know, adjust our attitude towards the issue accordingly. Thank you so much, Alex, for that. That's been incredibly insightful, interesting, and hopefully informative and educative for our viewers. I think, um, if nothing else, I think the, the term you've used there a couple of times at the end of performative cruelty to describe the government's approach to migration over the last decade, and indeed previous governments as well, not just the Tories, and you know the, the Labour government in the, the 90s and noughties was uh, similarly so. Uh, is, a, is a very apt descriptor, I think, of everything that um, we have sadly been experiencing from government in recent years. But um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you very much. Hope the rest of the show goes well.